All right? Uh, so I have essentially two summary slides for topics, and if anyone has any questions, I can go into detail about any of them. Uh, so they're divided into two categories. First it are things that um, are cleanups, and the next are features, new features. Uh, so for instance, one thing that we need to clean up is how we do Boolean handling. Um, at the moment, and we've noticed that once we added early break factorization, we failed to vectorize a lot of times because the vectorizer can't vectorize the Boolean condition. This often happens when you, for instance, um, have uh, one side, of, the, one side of, of your equal has a smaller data type than the other, so it has to unpack back and forth, and that, that quickly falls apart. Um, this, this infrastructure is quite old, and it's kind of a hack. A bigger hack than the things I usually put in, but... <laughs> uh, the second thing is that we would like to delay the detection of, of the vector type to a bit of a later point, where we have more context and are able to analyze it, not just at a per statement basis, but over the entire um, thing that you're trying to vectorize. So this should hopefully prevent us from picking the wrong factorization factor and then have it to commit to it. Uh, the next thing is uh, to, I say, remove if conversion, but the plan is to move it inside the factorizer. Uh, at, the, at the problem, the current, at the current time, if conversion has a problem in that it basically commits you to a path and the vectorizer has no choice anymore. It has to continue down that road. So for instance, if it decides to mask an instruction, you must use a, a masked mode in the vectorizer. Whereas if we delay this, this, then we have a lot more opportunity. And also there are cases where if convert cannot do the conversion, but we should be able to still vectorize the code using masks. Do we know of any cases right now where if conversion is required to trigger vectorization, or do we think those are all going to be hand something we can handle? Yeah, it's it, it basically all the time there's control flow in the vector in the loop. And so, if we're removing it, are we? Is that just a mislabeling? Are we really just deferring it? Yes. Okay. The vectors. Yeah. Do you, so what if you don't vectorize? Do you miss out on the if conversion else as well? Yeah, so today if you don't vectorize, the if conversion tree is thrown away. It's, it's only used for, for, for the vectorizer. So, so you can enable it on the command line, and then it will also do the if conversion on loops, and it will keep them. So usually it does if conversion and puts that into a separate loop, if converted version and keeps that loop only when the loop is later vectorized. When it's not vectorized, you get the original not if converted loop. So the, the if conversion is just an enabler for the vectorizer. And if it's later not vectorized, the if conversion is thrown away. The if conversion for the vectorizer. There's if conversion on RTL, there's if conversion done by the FIOP pass and by the if, if combined by, 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 by a lot of passes. So, yeah. If you defer, does this mean that if the announce blocks then get into the ESLP tree? Yeah. So one of the things is that we would like to do control for vectorization inside the vectorizer. And there you basically have to predicate the instructions anyway. So why have if converted to it beforehand instead of, and instead of just handling it directly in the vectorizer as a control flow vectorization? Right, so in the vectorizer, you can choose to either mask the, the instruction, or if it's a block of instruction, you have to mask the entire, the entire block. Right. Uh, so the next part is, uh, like Richie mentioned, generate code directly from the SLP graph. Um, one of the reasons why this is important is that, for instance, um, today for control flow vectorization or early break, we are tied to the control flow of the scalar loop. So it means we can't reorder exits, we can't even SLP multiple exits into one. And 
so this limits the amount, the, the amount of control flow we can actually vectorize. This also means, and it's the reason why we don't support epilogue vectorization in, on, with control flow, because once we move the statements to make it safe, we've then broken the link to the original scalar code. And so by removing this, we can get all these features back. And conceptually, it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. yep. Also, conceptually, it makes so much sense because SOP is not really factorization. It's using what in the instruction manuals are called factor instructions. Yep. That, that's all there is to it. So. And at the moment, so when you do SLP scheduling, if you have the freedom to generate your own control flow graph, you can, for instance, put the axes that are cheaper to test first, since all the axes are axes anyway. They're going to leave the loop. Right. Uh, so, one of the other things is to move patterns that are currently do, I'm working on the scalar on pattern matcher into the SLP pattern matcher. And the reason for this is that we kind of have to commit to patterns. Once you, once you match the pattern, then you either factorize or you have to cancel SLP entirely and go down to, to the loop factorizer. Where you get into trouble is that the patterns are local. So let's say you have a shift by immediate. Most ISAs only support shift by immediate on the vector, on a uniform immediate. But once you form the, the pattern at, at, the, at the scalar side, and one has, for instance, immediate one, the other five, then you can't build your SLP tree anymore. So you, you're then forced to, to abort SLP. But if we defer the creation of the pattern, we can look at the, at the entire structure to figure out if the pattern is safe to apply or not. This is one of the big reasons why a lot of the patterns in the current vectorizer can't really be implemented, because you have to pick. So does this also mean that the existing, um, existing loop style pattern matching is all that moving to the SLP data structures? Is that how it's really bootstrapped? That's part of, part of the plan, eventually. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, we, we do have a lot of patterns that like you are vectorizing a multiplication by using shifts and adds. There's technically no reason that should be a separate pattern magic. We have to vector, we have a vectorizable mm -hmm. multiplication function. I, I mean, I, it can just vectorize mm -hmm. with adds and shifts or during analysis, create that pattern. Well, it seems to be like shift and add. I'm not sure that belongs in the vector instrument, right? Because it's, it's just multiplication. Yeah, but it, it, I, I think not all ISAs support, for example, integer multiplication of unsigned or oh, yeah. stuff like that. So, so there, there are weird cases, like in, in x86, you have uh, so quite we, some. We have already normalized the code to, to do, uh, optimize uh, multiplication by a constant. Mm -hmm. so this same code. Ooh, we're actually reusing that in here. Yeah, but because that code doesn't work on vector modes. And, 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 and like that's the case of integer division, which only very few vectorizers have. And if you divide by a constant, you can do it with the multiplication. So will this stuff be ready for TCC 15? No. no, we are not planning <laughs> to do any changes that would then cost so in case. So we want to keep the possibility to undo the did now and that I want to complete for stage one. If it happens that, you know, shit happens, right? Exactly. So, so the plan is to not do this for this, for GCC 15, but only yeah. for 16. Yeah, well, we're happy that it's working. And of course, given time and manpower and you know. And it's, it's a pretty, pretty small thing. Well, relatively to this whole SP thing, right? This is relatively small. So it's only a few words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All details missing on purpose. Right. Well, so I, I think it's good for the pattern recognition to get rid of creating yes. the SSMAs and. And state yeah, and just, just create the SLP tree. Yes, yes. Marvin, yeah. 
So, so the, 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 the fun thing is that we have P pattern matching, which did that, and even the discovery does it when it has mixed lanes with plus and minus. It just generates fake SLP trees without statements. It's, it just works. But of course, it also needs to work with the old code that's not using SLP. Does, does, does anyone understand why it worked? No. <laughs> All right. The, the next cleanup item is uh, making patterns support other patterns as root statements. So at the moment, a pattern can replace another pattern, but it cannot use another pattern as, an, as its input. And this is problematic, again, because the way we have to handle, for instance, on vector booleans, we have to rec have, a, have a Boolean record pattern, but then anything else that wants to optimize Booleans can't, do, can't use that output. It has to redo the work because only one pattern can match at a time. So it's making it a bit cumbersome to do any kind of optimization that needs a previous pattern. So, the, so that is really a pure cleanup. That's not an attempt to do anything particularly new. You're just trying to simplify these, these kind of chain operations. Supposedly, I, I would guess the... Yeah, yeah, basically. So, so I, I think if the, the support patterns as root might be moot when we have moved patterns to SLP. Yeah. It might be good to have as an intermediate step, depending on how we are getting to implementing all this stuff. Yeah, because on SLP, we do support patterns as root already. That's how the current complex number detection works. Just work. Well, and, and you, you can theorize that once you have patterns as roots, there may be opportunities that start to become visible at that point. Sure. Okay. I was just making sure I understand what you're doing watching. Yeah. Well, I haven't thought about SLP in 20 years. <laughs> Not since the MIT paper came out. So, so the yeah, only, only when Richard talks to me about it. <laughs> So the only thing on this, on this particular list, Slater for GC15, is the SLP early break support. Uh, that's mostly working already today, and it's actually a lot simpler than the original loop factor as one. Well. Uh, the only thing missing is checking that the code motion is actually doing what I think it's doing. So what does it do? Uh, basically, it supports uh, generating um, early, early exit loops based on the, the SLP graph. So, so, in some way, you can describe in the graph that you have an early break. Yeah, you have, you have an exit. So, turned out. Yeah, when you have some way to express that. So, we don't actually have to do that. All we really need to do is use the, your, your gcont as a root statement and start SP discovery from there. So, it's just, it, just, it just becomes another subgraph. And anything that's part of that subgraph is part of the thing that you need to for the early exit, and then you just schedule them. Into, into, into the right location. So, so we, we, we are needing more features when we are code generating from SLP directly. So in this case, it helps us that we still have the Gimple. So, get, so early break vectorization right now is only with the, the old style, is that correct? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And Robin, do we, do we think that's going to work for the case we're looking at with XC? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's our demo, isn't it? Least on support first no? no, so we don't have first faulty load support. Okay, well, yeah, I thought it already got in, so I, no. I may be. You will. Being yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, I mean, the other thing that's, pro that's on the next slide is that we will get alignment peeling. Um, so I'm sending this here, but not first faulty load support yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the next one is to replace the x86 gather and scatters from the built-ins to the internal functions. Uh, that's, again, just a pure cleanup thing. And the last part is split vectorizable functions, in, because the vectorizable functions currently have two modes of working. You first analyze, and then you then cogen. But by the time you do cogen, sometimes you have to do a lot of the work for, to prepare the, the values for, for, um, for the cogen. So it makes sense to split them into just doing analysis, saving the results, and then reusing as much as you can for cogen. Yes, please. 
<laughs> yeah, so the, the X86 was the was the first was the first ISA to have it, and they designed the interface with the vectorizer to them. Internal functions didn't exist, and yeah, and then ARM came along, and Richard Seniford added the internal function thing. And they do not nicely map. I so I tried twice to do this. <laughs> so you can now estimate that I will need to share time or hope for somebody else to only need one time. <laughs> All right. So that's it for the cleanup stuff. Now for the. Then last thing, split vectorizable functions that this uh, internal thing. Yeah. Okay. But it should make it a bit cleaner and a bit faster because you don't have to redo all the work. So this is probably part of getting the vectorizer proper data structures. So at the moment, the, the, the per statement info or the SLP node, it has information. Everyone has information how to vectorize reductions, how to vector. It's a big pile of things, uh, but each vectorizable thing that succeeds analyzing should have its private data structure where it records the things it needs, right? And then it's quite trivial to split, to do the split. And it, it's probably as part of splitting, you will figure out what's your private data, and then you can fix up the data, the, the yes. data structure. So naturally, when you start doing the splitting. Yes, <laughs> then you will no longer have the data you need and need to save it. You are going to make reasonable abstractions. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a new concept. <laughs> well, you have to realize that the, the old vectorizer done by, I think it was IBM, it's approaching 20 years old, if not long, if not older. This code was written before we really even knew how to structure it in GCC. Yeah, it was all towards code, yes. But now we have C++. Now we can do proper data structures. <laughs> <laughs> or we can do improper data structures in C++. C++ is not the solution. It is a tool with, that might be used properly. And this is a tool for robots. <laughs> <laughs> it was only a joke, just in case you didn't notice. There are places where it's useful. There are places where it can be abused. Finding the right balance is always tough. Not all of it is, is, is uh, GCC 60, right? No, no, no. It's just stuff that we should do in the future and are time permitting. That's that's as a that's GCC fifteen yeah. time. And most of these things should be pretty early. So maybe fifteen, but pretty certainly. I mean, there there are bigger things like the remove if conversion is certainly yeah, a yeah. quite big task, yeah. right? Uh, and I would also not prioritize generate code directly from SAP. So if I want, if I would. Prioritize. I prioritize on the pattern stuff because that. No, no. You you have to either copy the scalar loop and generate code or not because. Right. So it's, this, it's well, not. You can't copy half of the loop and. So th the problem is if we don't remove the link to the original basic block, then early break, for instance, will always be tied to single link. And that's one of the, the big limitations. So what you're saying is your priorities may be different than this. <laughs> it's often the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, it, that's good. So I will truly pick something else than Tamar. Yes. <laughs> you, yes. you say moving a pattern matching to SLP is higher priority for you than direct code generation from SLP. Yeah. Um, is it safe to assume that part of the, so A, there's a maintenance part of that, right? Just well, So, so for, for example, the pattern matching blocks the delay vector type assignment. Right, so it, it allows you to do some of these other things. Yeah. Yeah. 
it also seems to me that um, and it's also we have a consistent yeah. framework to do the pattern matching. If we need more patterns, we're only putting it in one place now. Yeah, so and it's so it's, it's a long-term cogen improvement or approach to cogen here that we want to tackle. Sure. So I think you know if you're prioritizing that. That sounds fantastic. I mean, it, it's it's. It, would probably be nice to draw dependence lines. For example, yeah. for example, the better Boolean handling. The Boolean handling is currently implemented in the patterns, so you don't want to re-implement that in the patterns again, yeah. right? You want to re-implement it somewhere else, maybe in patterns, but then please on the SLP patterns, yeah. right? So this is why I would prioritize. Well, maybe we should prioritize the vectorizable function splitting because. We will touch these functions a lot when we remove the non-SLP code. Yes. And that's also an obvious opportunity to split it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, of course, the priority, the first priority would be to remove the features we don't need, like the make the two data structures work together. <laughs> right. Get that. get that out. So, get those out and then see what we can remove and only then work on the rest. And probably the, the, the splitting is going to be a natural opportunity to improve the infrastructure, the data structure infrastructure. Yeah, so, so, so like um, on, on x86, we have the issue that we have that the target supports natively three different vector sizes, the SSE, the AVX, and the AVX 512. And the vectorizer, the loop vectorizer, sticks to the fact that it wants to use this a single vector size for each vector in the loop. Correct. And it does that by selecting a mode at the beginning, and then when it analyzes the, the data accesses, assigns the vector type without any context or everything else. And I've posted a request for comment series last year, at around this time, uh, that f kind of changed that. Uh, the first issue you run into is the patterns. Yeah? Um, and, and not commit to the size or the mode early, but instead first Try a lot of analysis to get context, and then don't decide on the vector size, but decide on the vectorization factor, because that's much more uh, easier to understand. I think it's much more reasonable, and there are less useful vectorization factors than modes. Like if you use what, how many modes you are comparing on ARM, I think it's 20. It's real. Risk five. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah I, I, that's a really interesting simplification there. Focus on, um, oh gosh, I just lost it. But avoid the modes and think about vectorization factor. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so basically, you, you, you concentrate on the vectorization factor and then on really smaller vectors, if it makes sense. Like, then you don't need that much unrolling if you have a char data just in two statements, but you work on doubles exactly. on 200 other statements, right? So, so you do the whole code chain basically for all the sizes, and then, and then select which one. That's 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 what we are doing right now. Yeah, basically. The problem with that is you know with there are cases within a loop where parts of you wanted one vectorization factor, and other parts yeah. you wanted a different vectorization factor. And right now, I don't think the loop vectorizer supports that. Well, so so the, the vectorization factor in, in, in vectorizer speak is the number of times you unroll the loop. So that's, of course, constant for each statement. one value you choose. For the vectorization factor, right. Yeah. And then you have the number of lanes in the vector. That, of course, depends on how your target lays out vectors. Like GCN has all the same number of lanes independent of what the size of your element is, right? Yeah. But like on x86, you can pack 16 chars into a vector of, of 16 bytes, mm -hmm. yeah. but only for integers. Mm -hmm. Too bad. Uh, just a note for the vectorization factor, uh, in normal loops, 
if they don't have any dependencies, you can unroll normally. But for the OpenMP loops, uh, you are basically required to unroll each statement separately. Yeah, but it, it, this is it, this is it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. There is a guarantee that you, you can do all the first lines, all the first statements, and second statements. But but with OpenMP, basically the the OpenMP lowering fixes the vector vectorization factor. I mean, you can theoretically unroll more, but it 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 fixes the vectorization factor. So, so what's the ceiling for each? Yeah, yeah. Chunk. So, so for instance, if you have some privatized variables, so which OpenMP basically guarantees that each each uh, single lane will have a private copy of the variable, and if that if that variable is not overstaken, then you can handle it normally if it's not a reduction or something special. But if it's, for instance, address taken, then you basically need to guarantee that there each lane has, has one. But we don't know how many lanes. So I wrote that, that hack, that those, those magic arrays, where you size an array by the maximum vectorization factor, and vectorizing can shrink the array to the actual number. Oh, OK. Often, often the address taking is, is a lot later on. So then you can actually yeah. just use a vector register. So one of the benefits of both vector versus vector, when you said that you get cost difference, vectorization uh, strategies. Yeah, so so on, on ARM, like you probably still want to go iterate over the, uh, the variable length and fixed length. Um, I'm not sure if you. So, so we basically, the, 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 the costing gets the, the statements, and the statement have the, the, the vector mode that's used. Um, but the way it is now, you basically will never mix fixed lengths and variable lengths, uh, well, that, or, fix, or different fixed lengths, apart from the hack you have in the back end for some special modes, where you use two float and for float, I think there's some, so, so there's a target to how the vector as it determines the, the mode for the vector. But like for instance, on ASUS for a simple way to think about it, if you only modes, then you have the issue that like Jeff mentioned, if you have something, only one statement that requires a higher VF, you're forced the entire thing. It doesn't take into account, for instance, that you, that you can do a widening load. So for instance, you don't have a V4 QI, but if the rest of your statement has a VF of four, you could widen it to, to an integer if your reference is comparing against zero. So stuff like that you can't do unless you start thinking about the VF instead of the mode that's required. It's, so so for, for example, your loop could have a, a static num, a number of iterations that is not actually the high vectorization factor, but a lower, right? And if you could have used the smaller vector instead of the higher vectorization factor, you would have vectorized the loop, but okay. now you can't. So I like to think of the X264 thing, which ha or has the static runtime iterations of 16 or 4 so or something. Yeah. 16 or 8 by 4 or, yeah, so they don't have very many iterations. So smaller vectors are beneficial. Right. So now for the new features. Uh, so once we've moved to having um, basically only single lane SLP, the plan is to try to replace the graph building problem into a graph merging problem. So that means that instead of trying to build the graph at once with all the, all the lanes in one go, as we do today, and in which you have to keep trying to backtrack to fit the instruction, that you build everything as single lane SLP trees and then try to merge them. And this hopefully gives us a better opportunity to do stuff like predicate out certain nodes so if you have a slight mismatch in the operation that you're doing, stuff like that. And hopefully 
not, um, well, not have to give up on the other groups as often as we do now today? reason to believe it will actually work better? No. It's, it's, it's going to be an experiment. Yeah. Um, so so, so, it, 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 so the, the current greedy discovery um, morphed into a not really well maintainable mess, as you can expect from a greedy thing that has heuristics. Um, and it's quite expensive. And now that we are for even this discovery, which would uh, so the, the optimizing that single lane building problem gets you the first step to the new thing, Is it? right? And, and if you are later going to use it or not, we at least have the, the single lane thing optimized. Yeah. And, and why the life of the people is taking some intense time these days? Because then RTL is in the lanes where so much anymore. <laughs> and even if it doesn't end up being better, but maybe the same, it still has the advantage that today, if we can't factorize the SOP3 itself as a group, we then try to split it. And so that splitting also takes a bit of time, since so you have to go over the tree and split it. In this case, you already have the split elements, and only if you succeed, you have the better one to work on. So it's a bit of a simpler concept to think of, I think. Yeah, so uh, I believe we have to try and see what happens. Uh, yeah, Rich already covered make fractional VF. Uh, make patterns cancelable. Um, again, the problem today is that once you commit to a pattern, you're stuck with it all the way through. We can cancel SLP-only patterns, but we can't cancel scalar skipping patterns. And so, for instance, if you get all the way to cogen and decide you can't do it, you can't just cancel that pattern and keep going. And so that's a, kind of a big limitation at the moment. So we skip over fractional VF, what's that? Uh, that's what Richie said the last time. So essentially, um, be able to re-roll of loops. So if you have a loop that's been naturally unrolled eight times, for instance, you can have a vectorization factor that says one eight and you go back up. Uh, yeah, so the next start is optimize SLP permutes. This is essentially, well, it's a bit of a cleanup and a feature. Uh, at the time when we added the complex number um, detection stuff, we, it works by inserting new permutes inside the tree and then simplifying them later on, because the complex, num the complex factorization requires you to unpermute the data sources. Um, this is essentially today a hack, but we do have a pass that we can change to correctly do this. Um, one of the, um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's still the same today, but one of the early limitations of the password is only pushes permutes down and never considers pushing permutes up. It does both now. Sorry? I think it does both directions so, now. Okay. Well, then it might be that we can just delete the hack that we have in place for complex numbers that should just work. <laughs> but yeah, it's something we need, to, we need to check as we're planning on adding more complex numbers, um, complex instruction detection. So, so I, I would expect that the, the permute optimization needs adjustments as I'm now generating way more permutations okay. for the loads and the stores. So... Uh, No, no, it's, it's, during, during, it's done during analysis. Because uh, I, I recently saw code generation from vectorization of a reverse loop going from up downwards. And it's after vectorization, it had uh, all the permutations to load, uh, load data backwards, then perform op uh, operations which really didn't care about the order of the elements. And then, uh, them again. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the, the reason for that is that the code that does this reverse vectorization is uh, done at, at code generation time. So we just emit the permute, so we don't yet emit that permute into the SLP graph, so the optimization phase doesn't see them. So it's not seen. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's more clean up. And presumably, in general, we're still moving permutes, hopefully to the loads and stores, so that we can 
for targets that have the ability to permute at load time. Those, those so, are talking constantly with each other? So, so <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, collapse into so each other. You're, 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 you're basically to move them through transparent mergers that you get fewer of them? So we get fewer of them, and there are targets that can do some permutations at load or store time. Yeah, but I, I think it, they can all uh, just the, the inversion thing. Uh, it might be more complex than that. Yeah. Uh, not a target I'm currently working on, but I know of one. <laughs> well, it's so. <laughs> Why? Uh, of, of course, I mean, uh, vector isas can go, do a uh, gather. That's basically uh, arbitrary. Yeah. Permit. But it's also usually a uh, costly instruction. Yes. But yes, so uh, in that case, the, the we. It is permutes that are, yeah, it, it, it would fit us. Right, it, it does, and that's exactly what my point was. It, it seems yeah. like as long as we have some kind of code motion, we have a, we have a path forward here. Okay. Right, so the next part is being able to coach on unvectorizable SLP trees. So essentially, if you have a small part of your loop that you can't factorize, you don't really want to not factorize the rest. So you might be able to do so by just duplicating the scalar scale statements and then just recreating the vectors and continue on, onwards from that. Of course, there are costly challenges in, in place for that, but it's an interesting idea to try out. So you just do a bunch of scalar statements and then you have this Exactly. Yeah, or, or if you have a, a, a complete, like from load to store sequence of statements that cannot be vectorized, you can just duplicate this without yeah. building statements because. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what, like, for example, vector lowering does, right? Right, so the next part is, uh, part is trying to vectorize control flow. Uh, so this is essentially if you have if then else block, I think initially we'll probably start with just large if blocks. And the idea is that, for instance, if you know that none of the statements, so if you have a compare, you know that none of the statements are true, so your mask is basically zero, you can skip the entire, the entire um, um block. And that's what's different compared to if convert, normal if convert, where you have to actually execute all the statements, but with a false, but with an empty predicate. So it's, it's also required um, when we do basic block vectorization, because there's no if conversion, so we don't version the whole function and if convert everything. Um, so for, there is in uh, in the spec CPU Blender, there's a nice function, which is basically uh, a, a mix of if and switch computing a constant zero or one out of floating point comparers. <laughs> and there is a certain compiler that can vectorize that, which brings you a 30% speed up on the benchmark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically vector SLP vectorizing control flow, basically. You have yeah. a series of compares that allow you, that you can do at once, and then if convert the, the result. So it's not really doing control flow at all anymore, it's just if Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't do vector control flow. Maybe GCN can do that. But, uh, so, so basically branch to a different statement for a different lane. Yeah. That's difficult. Yeah. See? Actually, it's implemented inside the loop. Yeah, and for instance, for SVE, we can easily tell whether there will be any element that, that, that will be active at all. So you can jump to your else branch or skip the thing entirely, stuff like that. Uh, right, so the other thing is alignment peeling for early break. Um, as I mentioned, that's almost working today, and I think we have it working for VLA as well. Uh, the only outstanding issue is some of the um, profiling um, stuff that Hans added. Unfortunately, there's quite a lot of magic numbers around them in the vectorizer, and we, it's a bit slow, slow for us to try to understand how, the, how those profiles match up. Uh, but after that, we should be able to send it, up, send it upstream. Uh, we've tried all the bootstraps we could. Nothing has failed, so it should be okay this time. 
Uh, we're also, as Richie mentioned, um, supporting basic block factorization of early breaks. Um, one of the compilers that Richie mentioned before also does an interesting thing in that they reorder the exit based on cost because one vector requires you to permute the inputs, the other one has them linearly, so it just flips them across each other to test the easier ones on first, and then it permutes the inputs to test the second one. So stuff like that are interesting to try to, to, try to get the support. Um, we also want to do basic block factorization support for VLA. That is, at the moment, you can only do basic block factorization on fixed size vectors, but let's say if you have five elements, you should be able to vectorize them by predicating out the, the, other, the other elements. Um, so in SVE and other ISAs, you have these histogram functions that basically tell you um, how many times that particular value is found in the range. Um, you can use this instruction, for instance, to do alias checks because you know the two pointers never overlap if the count is one all the way through. And so this allows us to do more factorization um, and also have easier checks for, for, for um, have a simpler alias checks for some functions. Um, as the part of adding early break support, we've added almost all the infrastructure in place to vectorize uncountable loops. Um, that is, if n iterators can't figure out how many times you're going to iterate, you can still code-gen the, um, code the, the, the gcont using a vector comparison. Uh, We've tried hacking it, it kind of works, but I'm pretty sure it's wrong, but <laughs> at least the, the code generation. The <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're just losing the main exit, right? You yeah. just have the early exit. Yeah, and because with the early break stuff, we support inverting the loops already, all that code is, is there to support the early act, the vector exit as the main one. Of, of course, cost modeling doesn't work because it, exactly. it uses the number of iterations. Loops at least two alternatives. <laughs> well, the b always profitable. For the alias checks with histograms, uh, alternative to SV twos. Sort of. Um, you could well. That's one use of the histogram function. The other one is just basically counting the number of elements. So I have, uh, I did actually fill in all the slides with information. Wait, wait, that's too many slides for the time left. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. This one. Uh, so for instance, here in the loading of the, the records embedded inside um, the histogram itself. Normally, you won't, you won't be able to factorize this loop, but with histogram count, you can, for instance. Uh, while I'm here, I'll just continue on this one. Sorry, I, this just, I don't know where this came from, came out of the blue in my mind, but I was wondering, with the change to this, when we remove the old loop vectors, does that also mean we can get rid of the um, peeling functions, like the older, that really, I'll just say, nice codes to peel the, um, the loops, uh, the stuff you were swearing at when you had to do early break. The, the In theory, when you generate the code directly, you could have to generate the finals. Yeah. Just yeah. So you still need yeah. the, the peeling for the finals. Yeah. Okay. Damn it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uncounted loops are loops like this. We've pretty much already covered it. Uh, I'm going back because this, these slides are in a different order than these. Uh, so we want to finish up on the work on the de dependent file factorization. So think about the cases where you want both the index and, for instance, the minimum value. Uh, Today, we can, we can give you the index or we can give you the minimum value, but we can't give you both. And this is because of how the analysis um, phase detects the finals. So if you get lucky and you see the part that has the minimum before the index, then you're good. If you see the opposite direction, then it's a lot of work to, to, to figure it out. So we need kind of a general framework of how to deal with these with this dependent finals. 
Um, in a lot of cases, well, GCC fails to vectorize because it can't do a particular reduction, but it's quite simple to add code for it if you can figure out where. Like one of the big problems I have, for instance, um, implementing at VLs, um, widening reduction support, is that I just can't figure out where to even start. There are two different ways to, to detect the uh, reductions, and both of them are very complex, and both of them are undocumented. Yeah, I, I, I born into that last step. Oh, I can see that. Okay. <laughs> Not something I'm working on anymore, but... Um, Half of the code will vanish. Good. <laughs> well, not that the uh, remaining half is easy to understand. No, but I, one of the problems I was looking at was, um, mm -hmm. well, I'm trying to dredge up four-year-old memories here. Um, heck, what are we doing? We needed to, to know range information in the vectorizer that we we're missing so we would emit, I think it was a narrower shift than we were emitting? Does this sound like anything you've run into before? Okay. I, I'm i certain I can't get access to that case anymore. So I'm gonna set it aside until you guys do something. <laughs> yeah, so for instance, this particular case is an easy one is for instance having an OR somewhere. So if you have an OR of two, um, of two chars and you're storing it to an int, at the moment we are forced to unpack it to, to an int and do the ORs as int even though it's the same thing to do the or as a byte. Yeah. Well, it's C that says you have to do that. Yes. yes. So at the moment, the, over, the overwidening pass, if it doesn't find any range of information, it just gives up. It, it doesn't try to use the actual operation or any third information for it. But because of this, we end up over-factorizing quite a lot of loops. Well, actually, so it sounds like you're trying to, to are you doing something similar to what we do in expansion where we have expand widening and using a widening operation to vectorize something you couldn't vectorize before? Well, I think the, the, the over widening pattern, it's patterns, uh, <laughs> pattern stuff, it tries to prove that it can use smaller, smaller. types okay. to do so, the operation okay, so in. The first problem I was referring to. Okay. Yeah, I, I started wiring in VRP into that code, got lost, and moved on with my life. <laughs> but it seemed like there was an, al almost an inf enough information from the old VRP code, pre-ranger, to do what you, were, what you were trying to do in there. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what the actual problem is, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a mix between patterns and how they are used, and the pattern and the overwidening, they are tied into the bool handling because they use the same underlying data stuff, and only Richard understands this. The other one, uh, the other Richard. Well, the basic problem the here is... here. <laughs> as soon as you use a single pattern, you uh, use Google as the same names, which, which uh, a range doesn't know about. Well, that as well. And, and they are not in the IL. They don't have SSA operands because <laughs> they are not in the IL, and that breaks stuff. And then, of course, it does, you can't use ranges. Regarding the basic book VLA self support, uh, and, uh, it's too late, but I, I wonder what, what you do if you actually have more, uh, more lanes than, than the hardware actually has. Do you turn the, the you have scale of the code into a loop? No, no. no it, it so this is this is for basic block vectorization. So for scalar code. So what we do at the moment is where we we yeah. So, so what we are doing, we are splitting into chunks of hardware size. So if you have just SSE, where we are we are we are we. I I I don't think it's really VLA, but it's basically fixed length. But, but not all lanes active, because yes. with VLA, indeed, uh, you would have to duplicate statements. Yeah. But you have vectors of eight. Yeah. So you can well, do that. You, you can just like guarantee that all the VLA vectors Yes, I think VLA so, so with, uh, like, like uh, with, with risk five and with uh, SVE, you have a min yeah. I think. And 
that's the one you need to target. You can't target a bigger one because if you if you say set VL eight and it gives you then four, but you are replacing eight scalar statements, you would need to replace it with two statements. And 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 you had you would have to like optimistically unroll very many times and have lots of knobs for no good reason, so that won't ever be profitable. So the only way to tackle this is have the fixed length modes, but only for the smallest guaranteed size. Okay, right. But if, but you can you can you can use the the, the times two times four the, the the other thing risk five has. Times two, times four. Oh, Elmo. <laughs> the Elmo. Elmo. <laughs> Pro probably will not perform well, but it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> We're weird. <laughs> but it, it at least hides the duplicates from the CPU. Right. <laughs> so, uh, is there anything the targets can help you with? By testing something or by shipping some input on what you do? By by adding uh, CI workers for power and Z. CI workers to what? For the patch, patch, well, or patchworks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm posting patches, yeah. and then I get nice test read results for ARM and for RISC V for free. Is it not orange? Yeah. No, it's. it's we have no idea. This all ran and it's triggered by email. And so, it's so rich if you get out that you're sending special informatic ways, this is patches, he gets CI. Yes. Yes. That is not a so, so who is you can also CC a special mailing name, yes. So who is running that CI thing? The the sorcery guys. Okay. The, the sorcerers. Sorcerers. Uh, <laughs> it's magic. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And there's 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 there's, there's, there's two different Two different approaches because they the the the, the, the yeah. So the the arm the the they automatically grab the patches. Yes, from the mailing list. We don't have that on power. I mean, it would be nice. So 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 the in the, 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 there's uh, sorcery folks. They they have some some regular meetings which you can join, and you ask them. So they basically. And build bots. Yes. And and yeah. And I think okay. I'd like to get that started. Yeah. So check out the Maxim Maxim yeah. Kirkhoff. Um, I think all their stuff is open source. Yes. Including all of the stuff that monitors the lists. So you ought to go just pick it up and reuse it. I've been meaning to do it for my own tester and just do not have the bloody time. I didn't know they were anywhere near production quality yet. They yeah. haven't announced anything yet. They so. talked about it the last fall and it works quite well. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I think usually there's an action to be taken. I, I think there's, yeah, there's um, two different toolings because uh, the, the, for the results uh, for Risk V, you need to go to uh, GitHub and pull them, and uh, they, they, so the, they look different. So that's probably a different set of setup for Risk V and ARM. So you can talk to two different guys, and I'm not sure which one is. That makes three. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention, but what is the picture question of the CI stuff? We looked at every one. Oh, I see. Thanks, Yeah. So, Maxim's regression tester is fantastic. It is a multi stage, multi component regression tester with GCC, Binutils, GDB, and glibc. And it can find from a regression in a multi component change which of those changes backtracks cause the regression. It is full on production ready, and Lanero's been using it forever. We have both the AR64 and the ARM results uh, that we look at every week. If your patch fails those things, we don't look at your patch. Uh, the other one is the two Red Hat testers. One is we build 32-bit i686, because if it fails, it means you didn't think about 32-bit architectures. And so then that auto fails you. And the other one is just like, does the patch even apply at the time it was sent to the list? All those testers, though, are using patchwork as the fundamental way in which we access the patches. If we, if we send things that don't work with patchwork, that's just, we have, 
That's a separate problem, yeah. But the testers, uh, the Lanero tester is a complicated multi-stage setup with Jenkins. The uh, more generic testers that can integrate with Patchwork are much simpler than that. And DJ has the glibccd example of how to do the integration around the APIs in place. Um, I'm, I just got access to uh, some of the Z series uh, IBM Linux One instances, so I'm actually gonna light up a S390X uh, CI tester, pre-commit CI tester too. The Lenaro tester is actually also wired into the RISC V tester. So we see results for RISC V patches being run in the ARM domain. So if we do something generic and muck it up, we get a complaint from the Lenaro tester, which is good. I love it. Um, and it all is integrated into Patchwork. So you don't have to actually go to GitHub or GitLab or whatever the hell it is. You can actually go to Patchwork. Um, the but, and we've talked about this for years, is that the way in which patches are sent to the GCC mailing list is special. And that's all y'all's problem to work out, so. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's all y'all's. <laughs> if you want to get our telecom brains, we need to have some stuff. Yeah, so we, we defer the discussion to the hallway. So thank you for attending. Thank you.